What's going on guys? My name is Steve. Thank you for stopping by my channel. Today we're going to be reacting to Newgrange, Ireland's ancient masterpiece. I just got done with a video that was talking about the prehistoric god kings of Ireland. And the reason I started that video is because the video was talking about some ancient DNA that was found at that Newgrange site that tied the person that was entombed at Newgrange to certain other people that were entombed in other monolithic sites around Ireland. You know, it was a very interesting video, but it didn't go into detail about Newgrange itself, which is why I was originally uh, checking that video out in the first place. But nonetheless, guys, I recommend you check out that video. Um, I will hopefully have both these reactions up at the same time. So, uh, Look out for that video as well. You know, I'm not sure if you're checking this video out first or the other video, but if you haven't checked out the other video, it'll probably be up at the same time this one will be. So when you get done with this video, you might want to go ahead and check that one out because I definitely found that interesting. Uh, definitely learned some new stuff there, but it didn't really tell me about Newgrange itself. And uh, since that's what I'm trying to check out, I realized I had to go and find another video. And you know, I've checked out some of Simon's other videos before, and he does a good job of explaining in detail what he's trying to teach people. And so I think out of all the other uh, thumbnails and titles I've seen, I think this will probably be the best version of a Newgrange video I can react to. But like I said in the previous video, guys, I'm checking this out because I've had a lot of people, especially in my Stonehenge reaction comment section, recommend I check out Newgrange. And based off the little bit I've seen, I really didn't learn much about the site itself in the previous video, but looking at the thumbnail and the still shots of Newgrange, it's a very interesting place. And so anyways, guys, enough rambling for me. Let's go ahead and dive in and check out Newgrange. Ireland's ancient masterpiece. About 50 kilometers north of Dublin, near a bend in the river Boyne, sits one of the oldest monuments in existence. A vast earth-covered passage wow, tomb. Man. Newgrange is so ancient that it was already old when both Stonehenge and the pyramids were built. At the time its foundation stones were laid, advanced structures outside Mesopotamia were practically unheard of. In Egypt, in China, in mainland Europe, in the Americas, and in Australia, the first great building projects that people would one day undertake weren't even a glimmer in some local leader's eye. Yet here, on this rainy, foggy island on the edges of the Atlantic, a bunch of Irish farmers managed to get it together and build one of the greatest monuments in history. So who were these mysterious ancients, and what possessed them to transform this random Irish ridge into a center of culture? With no written records remaining, it's impossible to say for certain. And yet, there are enough clues littered around Newgrange itself to give us a tantalizing glimpse of their possible motivations. Today, Geographics, we're going to journey deep into Ireland's mystical past and uncover the secrets of its ancient masterpiece. If you were to ask someone these series, You know, that's wild, guys, to think that this place was old when Stonehenge and the pyramids were built. That's wild. You know, when I think of either of those two places, you know, as someone who just reacted to Stonehenge a few days ago, uh, you know, I think of those places is insanely old. So to think that this place was already there long before that's just amazing to me. It's mind boggling to me, actually. I can't even imagine. But, you know, so it's only about 50 miles away from Dublin. That That's good because Dublin is definitely a place I'll be visiting when I visit Ireland. And so... This place is probably not too out of the way for me to check out when I'm down in the Dublin area. So that's good to know. Um, I'm really curious. Can you actually go inside? You know, I'd be surprised if you could. Um, it'd be really cool if you could. I'm thinking maybe you can get tours or something, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you can't just walk in by yourself during the day or something. But let me know in the comments, guys, if you can actually go into this place, because I would love to. This looks really awesome. Seriously geeky question, what's the world's greatest ancient site? There are certain names that you might expect to hear. Stonehenge, for example, or Petra. But there's one name that, unless you were talking to an Irishman, would almost certainly be missing. 
Newgrange. Yeah, a giant never, never heard about it before. Earth and till now. Newgrange today sits beside the River Boyne, about equidistant between Dublin and the border of Northern Ireland. From okay. afar, it looks pleasant, but in an understated way, a man made hill ringed by gleaming quartz. But make no mistake, Newgrange wow. is far richer and far more complex than it first appears. The first thing you should understand is. Well, wow, hold on, guys. I just got to take a look at this. It's just amazing, dude. This is beautiful. And so he said this is quartz. That that if this is quartz, man, that that is that's even mo more amazing to me. I love that's one of my favorite stones. So uh, it's just it's just it's beautiful, man. It really is absolutely beautiful. It's just thinking about this being built long before the pyramids and uh, Stonehenge is just uh, that really is amazing when you take a look at this. And I mean, that's just it's beautiful. I mean. Don't get me wrong, you know, it's it's a it's it's a different type of interesting than say the pyramids or Stonehenge because those are like just these majorly huge stones, right? But this is nonetheless just as impressive. And I haven't seen the inside, so maybe it's even more impressive. It's just impressive in a different way. I just think it's it's just beautiful, man. Contains rock and a lot of it. How much? Well, it's been estimated that some 200,000 tons of the stuff were used wow. in construction, meaning it weighs more than the Sydney Opera House. Wow. And those rocks aren't just jagged lumps any bozo caveman could have rolled into place. They've been precisely cut, so precisely that the yeah. roof of Newgrange is completely watertight and has stayed... Hold on, guys. I don't mean to pause so much, but I just need to take a look at this. Wow, man, that's like this is like hieroglyphics that you uh, that you see in the pyramid on the pyramid walls. You know, same type of deal, man. It's, it's wild, man. That is so cool, dude. How did they put this stuff together so so tightly? You know what I mean? Without you know modern technology, it's just it is amazing, dude. It really is. It really is that way for over 5,000 years, which in a place as unrelentingly wet as Ireland is really quite an achievement. The rocks have also been engraved, not all of them, but enough to catch your attention. Grand heavy stones with swirls and patterns etched into their surface with what does that mean? remarkable precision. But it's not just the level of craftsmanship that makes Newgrange so fascinating. Take its size, for example. Now, Newgrange isn't big in the sense of big for a modern world in which we have the Burj Khalifa, but it right. is big in the sense of a, it probably spent thousands of years as the biggest damn thing in Ireland sort of way. <laughs> yeah. well, the pinnacle stands 11 yeah. meters above the grounds. The mound itself measures 80 meters across. Were you to zip back in time, abduct a random caveman, and drop him in front of Newgrange, he'd probably freak out at the sheer awesome size of the mounds that imagine. would have almost no parallel in Neolithic Europe. Well, after his it finished freaking out about being abducted by a time-traveling wizard man at any rate. And this is still only just scratching the surface of Newgrange. There are the 97 massive curbstones surrounding the place, each weighing over a ton, a ring of quartz that makes its side seem to glow from far off. There are even two similar mounds nearby, plus the 37 really? ancient tombs of Bruna Boyne. But to really get a sense of how impressive Newgrange is, you need to look inside. There, past the ornate stone doorway, lies a narrow passage tunneling deep into the mound. After 19 dark and cramped meters, it opens out into a stone chamber with three recesses tucked into the walls, one of which once held human remains. Six meters above your head, giant stone slabs are held up without mortar, unmoved since the day they were laid five millennia ago. But that's not the real miracle of Newgrange. No, to see that, you'll need to come here in the bleak midwinter and wait for the solstice. Provided there's no cloud covering the sky, you'll then witness an ancient miracle. As the sun rises on December the 21st each year, the weak rays catch a perfectly placed portal carved into the stone above Newgrange's entrance. Over 17 breathless minutes, the light from that portal casts a glowing rectangle onto the floor, which slowly creeps along the passage until it suddenly floods into the chamber filling it with light. Wow. And that means the world around you dissolves, the membrane between worlds collapses, and the morning seems filled with magic. It's a Does anybody else find that as fascinating as I do? How these people, you know, so long ago were so connected to their surroundings. They were so connected to the sky above them <laughs> that they were able to, without any modern technology, 
to know exactly when it was, exactly how to align things, and not just know where to align them, but be able to build these things so tightly and in such a way that they were able to to have it, you know, work out that perfectly. It's, it's mind boggling how they did that. And obviously it's not just this site, you know, uh, there are similarities, uh, you know, in a lot of different sites, Stone, uh, Stonehenge being one of those uh, is different, but it's the same type of thing. These people were connected to you know, the world around them and their sky so much that they, it was just like they knew it so well. It, it, <laughs> I can't even imagine. It, it's so interesting. It's, it, it's amazing. Cool trick, even for an architect to pull off today. In the world right. of Neolithic Europe, it must have seemed like a miracle. But who could have built something so spectacular so long ago? And what happened to them? Well, I'm glad you asked. The first thing you need to know about the builders of Newgrange is that they're a mystery. With no records left behind, all we can ever do is catch glimpses of them. But only being able to catch glimpses of them isn't the same as knowing nothing at all. First off, we know they were farmers. The ridges and valleys around Newgrange had been used extensively for agriculture by the time it was built. We also know that they were a wealthy civilization, at least for the era. After all, you don't spend valuable farming time building a monument if you haven't already got stuff like food surpluses sort it out. Beyond you know, well, the other video I watched before this one, you know, although it didn't go into detail about the New Grange site itself like this, uh, like this video is doing, it did talk about where they believe that the builders may have come from based off of, you know, the last video was about the DNA from that, uh, the remains that were in, in New Grange, supposedly. So I'm not sure. I'm not going to give details away about that if you want to check that video out. But um, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's definitely an interesting topic. And I, I want to see what uh, Simon has to say about this. See, I, I don't know if that DNA was found before this video or after this video. So... On this, we can infer too that their civilization had advanced pretty far in certain respects, like stonework and astronomy, far enough to create a unique portal for celebrating the solstice. But we also know their civilization was falling behind in other aspects. Writing, for instance, had already appeared in Mesopotamia at this point in the form of cuneiform. Hieroglyphics, they were also on the verge of being invented in ancient Egypt. Yet the builders of Newgrange would never master the concept of turning sounds or words into symbols. It would be this, more than anything, that led to them being forgotten. The last thing we can infer about these prehistoric farmers mm. is that they may, perhaps surprisingly, have had links to Iberia. Iberia is the bit of Europe that is today mostly made up of Spain and Portugal, about 900 kilometers from Ireland over open sea. While it's not impossible that some ancient Iberian dudes might have sailed all the way up to this rainy island and decided that a life of potatoes and Guinness was preferable to one of sunshine and flamenco, <laughs> it certainly seems unlikely. And yes, to all of you pedants watching, we are aware the potatoes had not yet arrived in Ireland. It's what we in Britain like to call a joke. Anyway, the fact remains that passage tombs like Newgrave along with the pins made from antler that were found inside it, are normally associated with the Iberian Peninsula. So what they were doing all the way up in Ireland is something we can speculate on, but we can never answer for certain. However, there is one last extra detail we can guess about the builders of Newgrange. They were ambitious and insanely so. To build Around like 3300 BC, they began building the tombs and monuments today associated with Bru Nabonia. They started small, refining their techniques, restraining themselves as they figured out their basic goals. Once they got the hang of things, though, they went crazy. Within a century of the first tombs appearing, work began on Newgrange itself. It's possible the ancient Irish always knew they were working towards this. We know an older structure stood on the site of Newgrange that was demolished to make way for the current one, so it's possible this ridge already held some sort of spiritual value. Hmm. Regardless, by 3200 BC, work had finally commenced. To help you understand how crazy long ago this is, just know that work wouldn't begin on Stonehenge over in England for another two centuries. And that would be the prototype version, the one you may recall from our Stonehenge video that was just 56 standing bluestones. The Mark II Stonehenge we see today wouldn't be built until roughly 700 years after Newgrange. Wow. That means that to Stonehenge 
his builders, New Grange would have appeared older than Machu Picchu does to us today. To put it another way, wow. we are far closer in time to both Christopher Columbus and pantaloons being an acceptable fashion choice True. than Stonehenge's construction How do you about was that? to Newgrange's. But while Newgrange might have been built way back in the mists of time, that doesn't mean it took forever to assemble. When his creators got going, they really got going. And look, if you're enjoying today's video about what is essentially an ancient mega project, you might enjoy my new channel called Mega Projects, and it's a channel all about mega projects. So if you think it could be for you, please do head over there and subscribe. There is a link in the description below, and let's get back to it. Today it's thought that the building of Newgrange involved up to 400 people and took 30 long years. With people dying younger back then, this means it likely took an entire lifetime. Wow. But given the amount of work involved, this totally makes sense. First, the builders had to find the stones. This Hold one, on. 400 people? Nah, man. I, I feel like it had to be more than that. 400 people, man. That just... Uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess over 30 years. Okay. Uh, but... Hmm. Okay, I just think it would be more than that, but maybe not. It wasn't as simple as just locating a good place to quarry and then getting to work. The structural slabs at Newgrange all show signs of weathering on their surfaces. This means that they weren't quarried, but rather they were found. Over in England, one of the theories about where Stonehenge's slabs came from suggests that they were left behind by retreating glaciers. In Newgrange's case, that's almost certainly what happened. So each of these big stones first needed to be located, which could have taken, well, God knows how long. While this was happening, others would have been spending years figuring out the precise point where the winter solstice sun would ah. slice through the sky so they could build their stone point. Portal. That being done, the smaller stones for building also needed to be found. These stones came from vast distances apart. There are some that were dragged up from the Wicklow Mountains some 114 kilometers to the south, some that were dragged down from wow. County Down over 100 kilometers to the north, <laughs> others came from the Mourne Mountains almost as far away. The gravel it was quarried locally from a vast pit. If these ancient farmers had been intending to build a monument that symbolized the whole of Ireland pulling together, while well, they couldn't have done a better job. The transportation of stones was likely done via boat, first sailing them along the Irish okay. Sea, then makes down more sense. the Boyne River. However, that would still have left the builders with nearly a kilometer slope that they needed to drag all the rocks up. Ropes and timber rollers would have been essential, which would have involved yet more work to make. All in all, it was a gigantic project, likely the biggest the British Isles, possibly the European continent, had yet seen. And here's the kicker. We still don't really know why they bothered. Why did these long dead guys guys go to all this effort. Most of the theories tend to focus on the remarkable solstice effects of the roof box. Being farmers, it could be that the Neolithic Irish linked Newgrange with the cycle of death and renewal that surrounded the winter solstice each year, the return of their crops from a dead land. I can imagine that, you know, if you're a farmer back then especially, I mean, you know, the winter solstice would have been a huge event. Um, I mean, both spiritual, but even more than that, it's it's hard to explain what I'm trying to say here. Uh, but it had to be they had to it had to be built for something you know very very important. It was it was obviously very important. You don't go to that much work, spend what he says thirty years building this thing, you know, and and taking stone from hundreds of kilometers away, and it's that doesn't happen unless you are doing something that is extremely important to, you know, your entire culture. Uh, it's interesting to ponder what the reasons could be. And maybe it is as simple as it was for the solstice. Uh, but I feel like it's got to be more than that, even though it, you know, anyway, let's continue. <laughs> On the other hand, it could have been more of a spiritual act. We know Newgrange is a passage tomb that, no matter what else it may have been used for, stored the remains of cremated bodies. It's been suggested that the sunbeam piercing the tomb each winter could have been intended as a literal pathway, one leading the spirits of the dead oh. out of their tomb and into whatever oh. afterlife these people believed in. Or maybe Newgrange's use was more prosaic. That's an interesting than idea. Neolithic site. Some have argued that the solstice alignment was more to do with creating a giant astronomical calendar. But there's another possibility too. One that's okay. I'm sorry to continue pausing, guys, but he just what he said there first was really interesting. So perhaps 
This could have been a tomb where they were to bury. Maybe it was pretty much everybody within the civilization, or maybe it was just for, you know, the kings and the royal family, so to speak, or whatever. I don't know. I, I'm not really sure. But bear, to entomb, I keep on saying bury, but you know what I mean. And to entomb people inside New Grange. And then at the solstice, you know, they worship the sun, maybe. And so if you worship the sun, then maybe perhaps uh, the light being able to come in at the solstice, I think he said for like 17 minutes, perhaps they thought that could help the spirits know how to travel out on this particular day to the sun. <laughs> I don't know. It's just, That's so interesting, man. That's so interesting. Okay. It's not accepted by many archaeologists, but that we should cover nonetheless. What if Newgrange isn't a prehistoric site at all? It wasn't until the mid-20th century that Newgrange finally underwent extensive restorations to become the site that we know today. Prior to that, it was little more than a giant muddy mound with an ornate entrance. Really? You can even find old pictures online of cows grazing on top of it. Because of this, modern Newgrange has some features that are controversial today. For example, it's not entirely certain the brilliant quartz facade was meant to be a wall at all. It could be that the quartz was supposed to lie on the ground in a ring around the monument. But oh. there's one aspect of the restoration that is very hotly contested. According to a small yet vocal group of academics, the roof box that allows the amazing solstice spectacle to happen wasn't originally there. In fact, it was only constructed 50 years ago. What? We really need to be clear that this isn't a mainstream view. The vast majority believe Newgrange today is substantially the same as it was thousands of years ago. On the other hand, the anti-roof box faction aren't just cranks. Their most vocal champion is Michael Gibbons, an archaeologist who used to be co-director of Ireland's Office of Public Works, National Sites and Monuments Record Office. In 2016, he co-authored a paper arguing that the roof box was created by accident during the 20th century restoration by accident? rather than being an ancient feature. But his argument, it went even deeper. Rather than a Neolithic site, Gibbons contended that Newgrange should be recognized instead as a Hiberno-Roman cult site. For those of us not up to scratch on our ancient designations, Hibernia was the classical name for Ireland. While Ireland was never conquered by the Romans, they certainly popped over from Britain for visits, and we know they spent time at Newgrange because of all the crap that they left lying around. What Gibbons and others argued is that in our rush to declare Newgrange a Neolithic site, we ignored a ton of evidence that it reached its present form and got most of its use during the Roman era. Since we're YouTubers rather than trained archaeologists, we're not going to make a judgment call on this one. All we're going to do is inform you that this theory exists, that it's not mainstream, and that you can read more about it yourself if you so wish. And So what do you guys think? You, do you think this is a Neolithic site, or do you think this mostly to come together during the Roman era? Uh, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that's interesting. I'd love to hear your comments in the comment section about this. Uh, you know, I learn so much from you guys in the comments section. I always pick up something new, so please feel free to share your ideas about this place. With that, let's get back to our main narrative. Although Newgrange was finished all the way back in 3200 BC, that wasn't the end of the work. Over the next few hundred years, the Bruna Borgna site was gradually added to until it was a vast place of likely deep spiritual importance. Unfortunately for those who'd built it, it wouldn't be theirs for much longer. Around 2500 BC, the Beaker Folk, still our favorite historical civilization named after a Muppets character, <laughs> arrived in the British Isles. Known for their distinctive pottery beaker cups, they quickly overran both Great Britain and Ireland. Modern genetic testing shows that they almost completely replaced the native populations in just a few hundred years. But replacing the natives isn't the same as totally destroying their culture. Not long after their arrival, around 2200 BC, the beaker folk began incorporating Newgrange into their own rituals. A huge enclosure of wooden posts was built around the monument in which the cremated remains of animals were buried. Just a couple of hmm. centuries later, the wooden posts would in turn be replaced by a stone circle. Beyond this, though, construction simply stopped. For whatever reason, the Beaker Stone Circle was the last addition ever made to Newgrange. Although the site itself would be visited by both the Iron Age Celts and the Romans, its era of growth was over. Now all that remained was for Newgrange to be forgotten. Mm -hmm. 
It's hard to pinpoint exactly when Newgrange vanished from Ireland's consciousness. Some have suggested it was already a relic by the Iron Age, although evidence seems to show that the Celts visited it. Others have pinpointed the Roman era on the British Isles as Newgrange's endpoint. Though, as we've seen, Roman relics uncovered suggest that the place still held some importance for them. That leaves just one other major shift in Irish history when Newgrange could have been forgotten. The arrival of Christianity. It was around the 5th century AD that Christianity finally reached this remote corner of Europe. By then, Newgrange hadn't been added to for over 2,000 years. In our own time, the Colosseum in Rome has had facelifts more recent than that. So it seems likely that Newgrange was already little more than a curiosity, a remnant of some long-dead civilization. But Christianity, with its prohibitions against pagan sites, seems to have pushed it over the edge. Quite how things unfolded, we're not exactly sure. All we know is that it was likely around this time that Newgrange was totally abandoned. And then, as time passed and the years rolled on, it was eventually forgotten about altogether. Still, some trace of cultural memory did survive, even if it was only in the form of knowing about a mound that was full of stones. Over the centuries, the odd builder would come by and dig some of that stone out every now and then, though thankfully never enough to compromise the site. Eventually, the monument wound up inside the lands of Mellifont Abbey. It's here that the name Newgrange comes from, Grange being a word for farm. As for the new part, well, it's kind of like how okay. New York or New England still retain the words in their names, despite being centuries old. At some point, the area was part of the Abbey's new Grange or farm, and the name just stuck. Even after the Abbey closed in 1539, the mounds continued to be known as Newgrange. That its true nature was ever rediscovered is thanks almost entirely to one notorious battle. In 1688, a complex series of events saw the Catholic King of Britain, James II, deposed and replaced by a Dutch Protestant known as William of Orange. Although William's takeover of England and Wales was so bloodless it became known as the Glorious Revolution, in Ireland it was a rather different matter. Their local Catholics rallied to the former king's cause. The result was William invading Ireland. His troops and James's finally met on July 1st, 1690. Their epic smackdown would become known as the Battle of the Boyne. Today, the battle remains a cultural flashpoint, especially in Northern Ireland. But for our purposes, it's what came next that's really important. In the aftermath of the Protestant victory, William doled out land to all of his supporters. Among them was Charles Campbell, who has gifted the lands that Newgrange stood on. Nine years later, Campbell was in need of stone for his estate and told his laborers to go and find some. It was this improbable chain of events that would lead uh, to the rediscovery of Newgrange. Okay. Hold on, what the... Okay. Just taking a look at this. So this... Is this the top of it? In 1699, the Welsh antiquary Edward Lloyd just happened to be visiting Ireland. A friend of Sir Isaac Newton, Lloyd was a keen scholar with a remarkable eye for detail. He was also hugely passionate about anything ancient. So when word reached him that some labourers on the estate of one Charles Campbell had accidentally discovered a secret cave while digging up rocks, he rushed to investigate. That cave, of course, was none other than the entrance to Newgrange, and Lloyd was able to get there in time to see most of the excavations and make detailed notes. It was from the four letters he wrote that we get our earliest scholarly description of Newgrange. Nowadays, Lloyd's letters are useful as a reference point when doing work on Newgrange and tracing its architectural history. But in the late 17th and early 18th centuries, they were also extremely useful for building interest. It was thanks to Lloyd's work that Sir Thomas Molyneux came to Campbell's estate to visit Newgrange. When Molyneux published his own book in 1726, it in turn enticed even more scholars to Ireland. Over the next century and a half, roughly 200 antiquarians visited Newgrange. Some were serious scholars there to learn, while others were basically crackpots there to stoke their own wacko theories. And some of these theories were seriously wacko. Since most of these history-loving dudes came from non-Irish backgrounds, most of them were convinced the ancient Irish could never have built such a structure. Instead, they twisted themselves in knots, proving that its real builders were the Vikings or even the Egyptians, presumably while taking a short break from building the pyramids. Still, this flood of interest did have one positive effect. By 1882, Newgrange was well known enough that it was included in the British Ancient Monuments Protection Act. Since Ireland was part of the United Kingdom back then, that meant conservation efforts finally began. Even so, it would take many, many decades for Newgrange to be properly excavated. It wasn't until 1962 that archaeologist Michael J. O. Kelly wow. started restoration work at the site. 
In the end, it took 11 years for O'Kelly to return it to its original glory. The new Grange you see in modern photos? It didn't look like that until 1973. What? Today, Newgrange is wow. on UNESCO's World Heritage List and regarded as one of the greatest, best preserved Neolithic sites in Europe. And yet, for some strange reason, it remains relatively unknown. Take yeah, visitor numbers. Definitely. In the last couple of years, Newgrange has recorded up to 200,000 visitors annually. Stonehenge, on the other hand, has recorded between 850,000 and nearly 1.5 million. Then there's wider awareness. While Stonehenge, Machu Picchu, the pyramids, Petra, and a whole slew of other prehistoric sites are instantly recognizable, knowledge of Newgrange remains mostly confined to people who either have a connection to Ireland or are massive history nerds like us. And this is a real shame. As we've seen today, Newgrange is a masterpiece of ancient architecture, a yes, monument that, at the time it was built, was unrivaled perhaps anywhere on Earth. In short, it deserves to be more widely known, its significance to our history more frequently celebrated. Because it was here, in this wet corner of this one rainy island, that a bunch of long-forgotten farmers decided to do something that had never been done before, to build a monument that would last for centuries. With today's video, we hope we've shown that, against the odds, they succeeded. So I really hope you found that video interesting. Wow, guys, uh, definitely glad I decided to uh, check out another video to learn about Newgrange uh, because the first video obviously wasn't about the details of Newgrange. It was more about, you know, the DNA they found at Newgrange. But uh, anyways, guys, this is this is an amazing place. Definitely a place I plan on stopping by when I'm in Europe, uh, when I'm in Ireland. Um, I'm surprised, though, like. I just assumed that this is pretty much what it looked like for, you know, I mean, I, I figured it had a little bit of restoration, but I didn't know the restoration was so, uh, so significant, um, you know, as supposedly it was. I mean, supposedly it took a, a decade or more to actually do a full restoration on this site. And it didn't really look anything like it does today when they started. Um, that's wild, you know. Um, you know, I, I hope that this is very similar to what it looked like because it's beautiful. And I just I just like the idea in my head. I like the idea that this is what it appeared to be, you know, thousands of years ago. But who knows? I guess I guess we'll never fully know if that's the case or not. But yeah, guys, like I was saying earlier in the video, I'd love to know if you can actually go into this. I mean, I, I'm guessing somebody, some company does tours or something, but I'm I'm curious, can you just, obviously you can go up and look at this, there's, there's, there's stairs. So obviously you can. The question is, um, can you do it by yourself or do you got to go with a tour? I don't know, but uh, this is really interesting, guys. And I think, I think this video actually did uh, Newgrange a uh it uh taught this well and uh so i learned a lot here and uh thank you so much for stopping by guys please click that like button feel free to drop your comments or suggestions about this video or others and don't forget to subscribe to continue to follow me on my journey to discover my british and irish ancestry till next time guys peace